Today's lecture focus is on probability. What is probability and how do we use the probability? First of all, when it comes to probability, we need to explore the idea of probability experiment. Probability experiment is an action or trial through which a specific results like counts, measurements, or responses are obtained the result of a single trial in a probability experiment is called the outcome of that probability experiment. The rest of all, the set of all possible outcomes of the probability experiment is called the sample space. For example, in flipping a fair coin, you have two possible outcomes. It's either the head or the tail two possible outcomes, no more than that. What is an event? An event is a subset of the sample space. It may consist of one or more outcomes. Take a look at the following scenario. Suppose you have a probability experiment which consists of basically tossing a fair coin. In that case, the sample space or the set of all possible outcomes include two values. One of them is head and the other one is the tail. So if I ask you to write down the sample space, you're going to write down S or the sample space is equal to the set including head, comma, tail and then close up the set. So this is your sample space. It has two members, head, tail. Okay, another example for you. Remember that, always write down the definition. Know what a probability experiment is, what is an outcome, what is the definition of sample space, so you don't get confused. Suppose now you roll a six-sided die. Okay. When we roll a six-sided die, it either lands on one dot representing one, or two dots representing two, or three dots representing three, or four dots representing four, or five dots, or six dots. So you can list them all as one, two, three, four, five, six. Each one of these representative of the dot. One dot, two dots, three dots, four, five, or six. So if I ask you to write down the sample space, you're going to say, hey, the sample space, which is the set of all possible outcomes, include these six numbers. Nothing else is in this set. Now, let's take a look at the following definition. What is the definition of classical or theoretical probability? Well, classical probability is used when each outcome in a sample space is equally likely to happen. The classical probability for an event, you can denote an event by capital letter like E, A, B, C, or other values, is given by the probability of E, which is a fraction. On the numerator, you have the number of members in the event, down, you have the number of members in the sample space. Very good. So now take a look at the following question. Find classical probability when you roll a six-sided die. We want to find the probability of each event. First of all, when you roll a six-sided die, the sample space consists of six outcomes. You might have a one, or it might be two, or three, or four, or five, or six, nothing else. So list the sample space with the set, including one, comma two, comma three, comma four, comma five, comma six. What is the probability of ruling a three? This is your event. We are representing this event by capital letter A. Well, since 
there is only one outcome in event A, which is three. So the probability of rolling a three by definition is one, the number of members in the event, which is just one value, divided by six values in your sample space. When you use a calculator, you get 16.7%. Perfect. Now let us make it more interesting. Again, always remember the definition. The definition of classical probability is just a fraction. You need to know how many members do you have in your event, and you need to know how many members you have in your sample space. So you need to form a fraction eventually. Well, take a look. You're going back to rolling a six-sided die, and we know that the sample space in this case consists one, two, three, four, five, six. Now the question says, find the probability of event B, which is rolling a seven. Is it possible? You don't have seven. So since it's impossible event, it means that the probability of that event is nothing but zero. So probability of rolling a seven is zero. There is nothing here. Zero divided by six or zero itself. So when you have impossible event, the probability is always zero. Again, let us just roll a six-sided die and then find the probability of having a number less than five. Remember that this question is different from the question on Canvas. On Canvas, this number is four, so you have to do the calculation yourself. So you roll a six-sided die. This is your sample space. All possible outcomes are listed here. When you're rolling a number, which is less than five, what's the meaning of that? It means that you have four numbers that are less than five. What are those numbers? One, two, three, four. You have to look at this set. You are not using any other set. The minimum value is one, then it's two, then it's three, then it's four, and you stop here because it says it must be less than five. So you have four numbers or four members in this set. Let us calculate the probability now. The probability of rolling a number less than five is, how many members do you have? One, two, three, four. Four goes on the numerator. What is on the denominator? On your denominator, you have total number of outcomes in a sample space. Hey. My sample space is just right here. It has six members. So that's how you end up with six down here. Four divided by six, two thirds. If you use a calculator, you get 66.7%. Very good. Okay. What else? We talked about classical probability. We have another type of probability that we call empirical probability. It is based on observations obtained from probability experiments and they have repetition. It means that you have frequency for those events. What are you going to do? You're gonna use relative frequency to calculate the probability. Very good. So in the relative frequency, as you saw before, it's very easy to build. The probability of event E is a fraction. On the numerator, you're going to just type or write the frequency of that event. Down on the denominator, you have the sum of all frequencies. Very good. As you remember from previous chapter, it's denoted by F over and okay, it's not that difficult. As long as I have the frequency of that event, I should be fine. Can you give me an example? Sure. Let's take a look at the following example. A company is conducting an online survey of randomly selected individuals 
to determine how often they recycle. So far, we surveyed 2,451 people and you have this information listed below. We want to know what is the probability that the next person surveyed all waste recycles. Take a look at the table first. Responses on the left-hand side and the frequency of that response on the right-hand side. For the response, always, the number of people who always recycle is 1,054. The number of people who often recycle is 600. 13. The number of people who sometimes recycle is 417. The number of people who rarely recycle is 196. The number of people who never recycle is 171. If you add all of these numbers together, it is 2,451. Hey, it's a very familiar number. Where have I seen this? It's in the question. The number of people that are surveyed is 2,451. So it must match with the number of people in the survey. Now the question says, what is the probability that the next person surveyed always recycled? Always? Always is just right here. How many? 1,054. Out of what? Out of total number of people who surveyed. So the probability of the event always recycle is the fraction. On the numerator, you have 1,054, which is the frequency or the number of people who responded always, divided by the total number of people in your sample. If you do the division, you get about 43%. But what's the meaning of that? It means that if I randomly select a person out of this survey, the probability that that person always recycle is 43%. Okay, that's a good chance. Not that bad. So, so far we talked about theoretical probability. Then we jumped into empirical probability. Let us talk about some relations from set theory and then jump into conditional probability. From set theory, if you have an event like A, as you remember, an event is nothing but a set. The complement of that event, which is denoted by A prime, sometimes they use A bar or A C. So if you open different stats book, you see you have different notation representing the complement of an event is the set of all outcomes in set S that are not contained in A. We also can form the union of two sets or the union of two events like A and B, which is denoted by A union B, A U B. You read it as A or B. It's the event consisting of all outcomes that are either in A, or in B, or in both. So we are going to set theory symbols to build some new events. The very first event is the complement of event A, which is denoted by A prime, A bar, A complement. The second one is the union between two sets. And now we're going to talk about the intersection. The intersection of two events like A and B, which is denoted by A, upside down UB, and it's reading as A and B, is the event consisting of all outcomes that are in A and B at the same time to the intersection. Using Venn diagram, if you have the sample space and you have a set like A, Inside that sample space, the shaded area here is your complement. Whatever that is not in set A is going to be outside set A or in the complement of set A. 
for the union, the union of two sets A and B, you're going to shade everything, both in A, in B, their intersection. And for the intersection itself, you just shade this little part that's showing the common elements, the intersection between A and B. Why it is important? Because we can use set relations and define probability for them. Let's take a look at this definition. A conditional probability is the probability of an event happening given that you have a given condition. It means that another condition must be there. Given that another event has already occurred. The conditional probability of event B given event A is denoted by the probability of B given A. So we use this vertical line to represent the given condition. It's denoted by P of probability of B given A as on the numerator, you have the probability of their intersection. This and represents the intersection, common element, divided by the probability of the given condition. So the probability of event B given event A is the probability of their intersection divided by the probability of the given event. Okay, what else do you have? Take a look at this example. The table below shows the result of a study in which researchers examined a child's IQ and the presence of a specific gene in that child. We want to find the probability that a child has a high IQ given that. Okay, we have a given condition. It means that we have to use conditional probability. We want to find the probability of having a high IQ given that that person already has the gene. Take a look at the table. In the table, you have some margins of the table showing that I have high IQ. How many high IQ are there? How many normal IQ are there? Gene present and gene not present. Take a look. The number of people with high IQ is 33 plus 19, which is 52. The number of people who has normal IQ is 39 plus 11, which is 50. On the other side, how many people have the gene? So if you add 33 and 39, you get 72. How many people doesn't have the gene present? 19 plus 11, which is 30. Okay, in total, you have 72 children who have the gene. Take a look at the question. We are interested in child who has the gene. So the total number of people who has the gene is 72. Gene present is 72. Now, we want to know what is the probability that person that has the gene has high IQ. Okay, it's not that difficult. I look at the high IQ, intersection with the gene present, gene present 33, 39, the number of people who has high IQ, the intersection is 33. So we need to do a division. 33 divided by 72. So if you do that, you get 45.8%. Forty-five point eight percent is the probability of selecting a random child. That child has high IQ given that the child has the gene. So this is just 45.4.8 percent, 33 out of 72.
please pay attention. You have 102 children participating in this survey. Very good. Another definition for you. Two events are called independent from each other when the occurrence of one of the events doesn't affect the probability of occurrence of the other event. Two events like A and B are independent when the probability of B given A is equal to probability of B or when the conditional probability of B given the conditional probability of A given B is the same as the probability of A. Events that are not independent from each other, they call dependent events. Let's classify events as dependent or independent. Suppose you have two events. One of them is tossing a coin and getting ahead. The other event is rolling a six-sided die and obtaining a six. Are these dependent or independent? Well, tossing a coin and rolling a six-sided die, they have nothing to do with each other. They are indeed independent events. Now let us take a look at another example. Driving over 85 miles per hour and getting into an accident. Okay, common sense says they are dependent. If you drive over 85 miles per hour, the chance of getting into a car accident is high. So these two events are dependent. Another example for you, another definition for you, then we jump into example. Two events like A and B are called mutually exclusive when A and B cannot happen at the same time. For example, if two events are mutually exclusive, they have no intersection. These two events like A and B, they have intersection. So since they have something in common, they are not exclusive. The Venn diagrams show the relationship between events that are mutually exclusive and events that are not mutually exclusive. Note that when events like A and B are mutually exclusive, they have no outcomes in common, so the probability of them happening at the same time is zero. Again, the very first Venn diagram shows mutually exclusive events, and the second Venn diagram shows the events that are not mutually exclusive. Why it is important? Because later, when we are doing calculation for the probability of the union between two events, we're going to use this. It's important if you have mutually exclusive events or non-exclusive events. The addition rule for the probability of A or B. Remember that or represents the union between two sets. The probability that events A or B happen or the probability of A union B is given by the probability of A union B, which is the probability of the first event plus the probability of the second event minus the probability of their intersection. A and B and is represented by intersection. If events are indeed mutually exclusive, then the rule can be simplified to the probability of A union B is the probability of A plus probability of B. Why is that? What happened here? This guy is going to be zero. If you have mutually exclusive events, you can just write zero instead of this probability. You can also extend this rule to any number of mutually exclusive events. Okay, how do we use this? You roll a die. Find the probability of rolling a number less than three or rolling an odd number. Since we have or, it means that we have to use the addition rule. But let us take a look at it. When we're looking at the Venn diagram, 
How many numbers are less than three? One and two are less than three. How many odd numbers you have? I have one, which is odd. I also have three, which is odd. I also have five, which is odd. Okay, I see something in common. It means that you have a member in the intersection between these two events. What should I do? I need to calculate each one of these probabilities separately and do the algebra. The events, as you can see, as you can visualize, are not mutually exclusive. Why? Because number one is odd and it is less than three at the same time. So let us take a look at the formula. The probability of ruling a number less than three or an odd number is the probability of a number being less than three or which is the union of event that it's odd. First, we calculate the probability that is less than three, then add it to the probability that is odd, and then you have to do the subtraction. You have to get rid of repetition, less than three and odd. It's already repeated in one of these, right? So you have to get rid of it. So the probability that is less than three, less than three, you have one and two, so you get two divided by six. The probability of being odd, you have three odd numbers, one, three, and five. Three divided by six minus the probability that is less than three and odd at the same time, which is one out of six. When you do the algebra, it becomes four over six or two thirds or 66.7%. Point seven percent.